Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining Dr. Ken Roy and myself, James Palsik here at Science Safety. This is part of our ongoing professional learning webinar series, conducting a science instructional space inspection, not just a lab inspection as Dr. Ken will talk to us about later. And with that, uh, let's look at what we're going to talk about. So tonight's session is all about looking at what you need to know when inspecting a lab from a safety perspective, an instructional space that is used for science, STEM, STEAM, because there are so many concerns surrounding all of that, that no one <coughs> really has a good idea of what to look for. And we don't want you to do just a superficial walkthrough and say, hey, everything's neat and tidy, it must be fine. That's one of the worst things that you can do. So we have put together a program for all of you uh, to really help you in uh, identifying and recognizing those areas of concern. And we're going to talk about those biggest areas tonight. And we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please put your questions in the chat box as we move forward. Now you can see on the screen in that image, you can also see uh, wherever Ken and I are at the moment on your screen uh, live. This is Dr. Kenneth Roy. He is still with Glastonbury Public Schools, as you can tell from his hat, and he is the chief safety officer there. He's the chemical hygiene officer, the designated asbestos compliance coordinator, PCB program coordinator, silica compliance, et cetera, all for Glastonbury Public Schools in Connecticut. In addition to that, Ken has multiple roles. He is the Chief uh, Science Safety Compliance Advisor and Chief Safety Blogger for the NSTA. He's also the Safety Compliance Officer for Ancella. Uh, in addition to that, he's authored 13 science and STEM laboratory safety books and over 800 safety articles in professional journals and through associations, including NSTA and Ancella. Council of State Science Supervisors, ITEEA, and more. Definitely a celebrity and definitely proud to have him part of the science safety team. I'm James Palsik. I'm the Chief Education Officer here at Science Safety. I'm also a thought leader and a show host on Ed Circuit for a Safer Ed program, uh, formerly the Director of Education, Safety, and Compliance for a very well-known uh, science supplier across the world. I have also, I have not authored 13, but I have three science and STEM lab safety books to my name, multiple chemical hygiene plans, and I'm the safety reviewer for the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Uh, I've done a whole bunch of podcasts and articles, et cetera, many of which you can find now all on edcircuit.com. So we're going to look at this, what to look for during a safety inspection main areas of concern in those common issues, chemical hygiene and responsible chemical management. That's a huge part of going through your, your department. And then we'll look at some holistic approaches to safety and compliance to mitigate risk management and make those informed decisions. And then of course, my favorite part, answering those live questions from the audience and the participants. All right, well, Dr. Ken, I think it's time for you to take the reins here and start your start your your program. JP, thank you very much. I want to certainly welcome everybody spending your evening with us, um, which I hope will be a very rich experience for you. Um, one again to raise your level of awareness, not to give you a sleepless night, right? Raise your level of awareness. Um, there's liability involved here, there's safety involved, certainly, so let's get to it. First of all, physical safety inspections. Physical means in the flesh, you're there, all right? Conducting an annual physical safety inspection in your science department's instructional sites. Now notice, this says instructional sites. It doesn't just say labs, all right? We all know, and I was a physics and chem teacher for decades, all right? We all know that sometimes you're teaching your science and there are activities, certainly demonstrations going on in what is known as the science classroom. And there's some things that probably shouldn't be done in there um, that need to be done in a lab. 
So this is why we like to talk about instructional sites, right? For labs and classrooms. And then also there's other related spaces, your prep room, your chemical storeroom, et cetera, et cetera. So when we refer to instructional sites, it's, it's beyond just laboratory. Is a necessity for multiple reasons with safety documentation, having the written record and safer schools being the priority. Let me say right up front in safety, we have a saying, let it be written, it must be done. Again, let it be written, it must be done. In other words, you always can fall back on that. God forbid you get into litigation or something, you've got something in writing that was shared with the administration or that the administration did not follow through with their board of education protocols and the like that are in writing that they saw and they didn't enforce it, okay? So it's very important, always put things in writing. <clears throat> have members of the science department, the school administration, and ideally the chemical hygiene officer participating in the walkthrough while making informed observations and performing routine evaluations of functionally, does it work properly, is the best scenario possible since it is a collaborative effort. Safety is a collaborative effort. It's just not one person. Yes, I'm the safety compliance officer, director of environmental health and safety for class of everybody's school. But I depend on custodians, maintainers, teachers, administrators, et cetera, et cetera, to make it safer. Another little thing to take a look at, safer. Notice I don't say safe. You can't make it safe. Let me repeat that. You cannot make it safe, but you can make it safer by following through with a lot of the protocols that we're going to be talking about today. Next. Dr. Ken, if you do not have a designated chemical hygiene officer, is there one in your district? If, if they don't have one? Right. If there is not a designated chemical hygiene officer, whose job is that? Oh, by default, per OSHA, by default, it is, guess who? The superintendent of schools. That's scary. Many superintendent schools have no science background, especially in chemical safety, physical, biological safety, and the like. But OSHA says if the superintendent does not name a chemical hygiene officer formally, who is usually someone in the science department, then that person, that superintendent of schools, is the chemical hygiene officer. And it's amazing when you bring that to their attention, how quickly they find someone in the science department to be the official chemical hygiene officer. Knowing what to look for, ah, key. Knowing what you must perform a safety inspection is a good first step in the process. But more importantly, is knowing exactly what to look for and why. You know, we can always look, but we don't see. Do you understand what I'm saying? So what are the things you need to look for? It's not useful to conduct a safety inspection using a spreadsheet or a checklist and not know what you are looking for at different aspects of your safety infrastructure system in the school science department. <clears throat> Some items may appear to be working properly at a distance, but when tested, you determine that there is not enough water flow in the eyewash station, or sometimes there's no water flow in the eyewash station, or there is an inadequate charge in the fire extinguisher. I do recall we had a whole slew in an advanced chem laboratory of fume hoods installed. And before I would sign off on it, we had about six or seven of them in there. Before we'd sign off on it, I said to the contractor, uh, I want to try each one. Well, you know, there's no country. Well, there's really no need. We had a specialist come in from Illinois and, uh, you know, they, they're the specialist. You're not really seriously. And, you know, we want to make sure. And he says, don't worry about it. everything. I said, no, I want to try each one. But turn the first one on. Fine. Sucking it right in. Put the second one on. It almost blew me away. Instead of sucking out, it blew it into the lab. Three of them, three of the six or seven were incorrectly wired. 
can you believe it? And if I hadn't have said anything, look what would have happened. Somebody could have got hurt really bad. So do not assume, even when you have an expert coming into your lab to do some of these things, always, always follow up and check to make sure that they are operating appropriately. Very important. Basic inspection guidance. There needs to be at least two people to complete the safety inspection and document the observations. You need a witness, just like any other thing else you do, just in case. Ideally, both of these people have the experience and education combined with some specific chemical hygiene officer or CHO or science instructional space inspection safety trainings to conduct these annual inspections, annual, yearly, right? If they do not, they are online services. There are online services available to provide the necessary chemical safety awareness training from trusted and reliable sources such as science, safety, and others. Okay, a typical secondary school, annual safety inspection that is very comprehensive requires four hours to complete depending on the number of instructional sites and related spaces. I have done these, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's a whole day, all right? Again, as it states, this is only an average. But you want to make sure if you're doing these inspections, remember instructional spaces and related areas, you need to go beyond the laboratory, right? Because there are certainly chemical hazards, biological hazards, and physical hazards in all of these areas that need to be looked at to make sure that things are done appropriately and safer. Okay. Ah, fire safety. Okay. Fire safety is an important part of overall program of having the key items fire safety plan. It includes items such as fire extinguishers. Well, yes. Uh, fire blanket in some jurisdictions and not in others. Buckets of sand. Now, very important here. Class D. Some of you may have never have heard of a class D fire extinguisher. That's if you're using combustible metals, sodium, potassium, lithium, magnesium, et cetera, et cetera. If they're on site right now, what I would suggest is the class D fire extinguisher, that should be in the chemical storage area and the prep room. If you're using normally just very small amounts of these combustible metals, there are class D fire powders that you can purchase, that you can use, Understand that these class D fire extinguishers are extremely expensive compared to a regular like ABC type. I mean, you're talking thousand plus. Uh, <clears throat> you need to have one for that prep room. But again, for the laboratory, unless you're using a lot, large volumes of combustible metals, uh, the powder should suffice. Around site emergency fire exit procedures posted near the door and are the core of this program. There are very specific criteria for each part of this fire safety plan, including having the ABC. Here we go, ABC fire type extinguisher in all of the labs, right? All of the classrooms in the prep room and either in or near the storeroom. Uh, mounted on the wall, not on the floor, so it can be a trip fall hazard, fall over and break somebody's toes, no. And depending on the weight of it, Dick, how high up it has to be on the wall. Um, having a service tag checked monthly, and usually the teacher actually should be responsible because you're the one that determines if the lab is safe or not for use. Uh, many school districts just have the custodians do it. And the gauge indicating that is 100% charge position, 100%, okay? As a reminder, local state fire marshals and the regulations specific for your school supersede the NFPA 101 life safety and OSHA regulatory documents. Your fire marshal is your friend. I can't tell you this enough. All right. Very important. Get to know your local fire marshal. Very important. They can be really helpful for you to help make it safer. A lot of stuff you do, your ventilation is not just things dealing with extinguishers. It's well beyond that. Your, how you store things, et cetera, et cetera. And they can really apply it to the superintendent and the administrators because they have jurisdiction over them, right? Very important. 
Okay. Eye safety, having a fully functional installed plumbed eye wash station, plumbed, that meets the ANSI ISEA Z358.1 standard and allows for 15 minutes, minimum 15 minutes of hands-free operation, tepid, tepid, and there is the degrees that are required under tepid. They found out, unfortunately, if it's below that or above that, <clears throat> the temperature of that water can actually do more damage sometimes than a chemical exposure. So you want to make sure, test it, measure the temperature. If it's not right, stop He's doing any labs that potentially might require it. Make sure you put something in writing that this needs to be fixed. It's required for science and structural spaces that use chemicals. The eyewash station must be accessible. That means you don't store things around it, in front of it, on the side of it. You have to have 32 inch of clear space. You need direct access. It's unbelievable. When I do mock ocean inspections, the things that I see, sometimes I will see ring stands, the rods, okay, the rods stored right next. Now, can you imagine having some of your eyes not seeing too well going? You bend down, the rod goes right in the eye. Your eye's gone. It's impaled. No. Please make sure there's nothing near there. It should be noted that the portable handheld saline water filled with one liter size bottles are not, are not acceptable as an eye wash station, but can be used to flush eyes while getting plumbed uh, inversion, right? Very important. The other thing is on a field experience, uh, the bottle is better than nothing uh, in case you do need it. So that would be a good thing to have. Okay, <clears throat> eye safety maintenance. And look at the Iowa station. If there is some scale, oh, this is what I love. Formed on the eye caps or nozzles, or even on the base, the pan. You can have these cleaned with some TSB or CLR and rinse it well before testing. Uh, the eye wash must be flushed for two to three minutes or until water is clear weekly. This is not only an ANSI deal, it's an also an OSHA deal. You're required to make sure that it's being flushed weekly, not monthly, not annually, or not at all, all right? Very important, weekly, and to remove any stale or stagnant water. You have to understand what happens if you don't do that, you can get chemical and biological hazards developing, which you don't want in an emergency when you want that water splashed on you, right? Uh, it must be able to operate independently to allow for the user to hold their eyelids open, right? Hold their eyelids open and have their eyes flush for at least 15 minutes. Again, a minimum of 15 minutes, room temperature. That was that tepid water. Okay. And I'm, I'm back here, Dr. Ken, because we had a couple of questions come in while you were talking uh, about that. And I just want to reiterate to everyone that the everything that we are discussing here tonight is based on legal standards and better professional safety practices. Is that fair, Dr. Ken? Absolutely. Those so that ANCISEA IWAS standard right there, Z358.1-2014, is the most current one that is out there that encompasses all these criteria we've talked about and about 25 other ones in that, in that regulation, but now, it is all there. Now it's very interesting. Oh, whoa, 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 go oh, back. Oh, oh, I get all excited. Okay, there we all go. Right. All right. <laughs> that standard that uh, JP referenced, right? That's actually a better professional safety practice. However, OSHA by reference, adopted that, which means now it's a legal safety standard, believe it or not. This is why when an OSHA compliance officer comes in, making sure that this in fact is being done, even though, again, it's really a better professional safety practice. And in the courts, those are equal. The legal safety standards, better professional safety practice. And it used to be that way. Like 15 years ago, they decide, you know what? 
things that NSTA, for example, says about safety are just as important as the local state government uh, or the federal government say about safety. So either one or the other, they're both good that you're required to have. Thank you for the clarity. Yep. All right, let's let us go. There we go. PPE, our favorite. All right, personal protective equipment, PPE. All right, safety goggles and glasses. All right, this is one of my pet peeves, I got to tell you. All right, I don't know. For some reason, science teachers, I, sometimes I hate to even say, no, nobody on here, I'm sure. But sometimes, you know, they just, I can tell you many times when I'm editing things and the author who's in uh, the tertiary level university uh, or secondary level, whatever, they uh, will have a picture of safety glasses and telling me they're going to use goggles. I said, those are not goggles. Those are, oh, no, 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 those are, those are goggles. No, 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 no. And I show pictures in the difference. So understand that there are differences between safety glasses and goggles. And these are used in very different situations. For any science instructional space involving liquid biological or chemical hazards, liquid biological or chemical hazards, you must only use approved ANSI ISEA Z87.1 D3, all right, indirectly vented chemical splash goggles for every person in the room, all occupants, all occupants, all right, not just the people that are right near uh the uh, lab table or or whatever everyone in that room because you can get projectile splashes all right so everybody must wear it for science instructional space involving solid physical hazards wear safety glasses with side shields notice with side shields are allowed these must meet again the ANSI ISEA standard for impact that's what the d3 is on there uh, safety glasses with side shields. Very, very important. And what I'm talking about physical hazard, slinkies in a physics lab. Yeah, springs, projectiles, all right? Um, anything that's a physical hazard, you have an option. You can use safety glasses with side shields or the goggles. Now, usually in bio, in chem labs, you're limited to the goggles. In physics, on the other hand, because there's little to no use of hazardous uh, liquids, um, they certainly tend to use safety glasses with side shields, but very important, make sure you have the side shields. Okay. Other nitrile, I'm sorry, other PPE or nitrile gloves and aprons, right? We've taken care of the eyes now. And now, well, what else needs to be covered in case there's a splash? There must be adequate PPE on hand, including nitrile gloves. Um, and in some cases you can use vinyl, but not latex. If you're using chemicals, I urge you to use the nitrile in multiple sizes as listed there for students and teachers and anybody else that's in that lab. If you have a visitor, if you have a special ed person in there working with a special ed student, all must have the appropriate PPE. <clears throat> non latex as I mentioned, not flammable lab aprons or lab coats for protecting clothing from accidental splashes in the science instructional space. Make sure that all occupants wearing PPE during the setup. Now, this is key again. You don't just do it when you're doing the hands-on. You get all the PPE on first, then, then you do the setup. You have the students gathering the materials, the equipment and the like because they can get hurt just gathering the stuff, right? Keep it on for the hands-on and you keep it on until everything is taken down. Uh, I do expert witness work and one of my cases involved uh, a case in a middle school where students were taking down uh, equipment and the like. And again, you have a ring stand rod and one student is talking to the other, and nobody has eye protection on, he puts his eye down, right into the eye, impaled. He's blinded, pop, the eye's gone, matter of a second. The lawyer who contacted me says, I don't think we have a case. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, 
This was after the hands-on piece was done. I said, first of all, there is no evidence that the teacher at any time had told the students they must use PPE. And number two, PPE is required during setup, hands-on, and takedown. They were doing a takedown. And guess what? Look, he would not be blinded in one eye if that teacher had told them they required to put on the eye protection as well as other PPE. So please, all three segments of an activity have that PPE on. Fume hoods, oh, another piece of work in some places. Now look how nice and pristine that fume hood looks, all right? I could tell you horror stories about fume hoods. Fume hood is designed to remove odors from chemical reactions in the fume hood and should have a face velocity draw of at least, at least 100 cubic feet per minute to be considered functional. However, this velocity should be checked because it can be very state in use. There are specialized companies that can inspect the HVAC systems and signs instructional spaces, including the fume hoods, to make sure that there are 100% fresh air being introduced to the science instructional space with no recirculation, all right? In other words, the air from that science lab shouldn't be going across the hall into a math class or in the hall to begin with, all right? That is the NFPA fire code, very important. If you're smelling the chem lab across the hall, something's not right, all right? Something is absolutely not right. And you need to find out, contact in writing your head of facilities and ask for them to have an inspection of the ventilation system to make sure that that ventilation is not being recycled elsewhere in the building. This is especially true if you're in an older facility um, because if you are and they don't have it, you're very limited in what you can do for um, instructional types of activities. Okay. Engineering controls are certain safety mechanisms and infrastructure in place, which are referred to as engineering controls, which refer to anything that is built into the science department instructional spaces that are designed to separate and protect people from potential by a light. And again, those are the big three hazards that you find. These include the master control switches, all right? If you have it for gas, electricity, water, et cetera, et cetera. Valves, emergency drench shower, fume hood, ventilation system, as well as eyewash described above. The master control system is often found at the front of the room or at the front of the lab instructor desk with variations that have a key and lock system, or just as simple as a valve for turning on the water, natural gases for science instructional space. Very, very critical to make sure you not only have these engineering controls, but that they are functional, that they are, oh, wait a minute, this is what you're doing. You're inspecting to make sure those things work. Okay. Chemical storage. Chemicals need to be stored and secured. Oh, I'm too, secured, that means locked up. All right, secured in segregated chemical safety cabinets that isolate them according to their family, such as acids, bases, flammables, toxins, oxidizers, and even more specific storage requirements. Understand that you cannot store all acids in a designated acid cabinet, despite being acids. Some acids don't get along with their neighbors, okay? For example, you must isolate nitric from all acids, all, capital A-L-L. -L. Storing incompatible chemicals together is one of the main observations that you should be making when inspecting the chemical storage facility, okay? Not good if you don't follow this. Very, very bad. Looking for accidents to happen. Okay. <clears throat> chemical storage observations. Oh, look at these beauties. When looking at chemical storage cabinets, if there's a fine white precipitate on the bottle, this bottle is telling you, giving you a message, all right? And on the shelves, this indicates an acid and a base are reacting, creating salt and water as a product. Odors are also a very good telltale indicator to alert you to incompatible chemical storage practices. There are thousands 
of chemical storage guidance resources available to research and always, I'm sorry, and as always, refer to specific chemical storage standard operating procedures found in your chemical hygiene plan and safety data sheets, right? Very important. Look at these photos on the right. Again, nothing here is staged. This is the real deal, okay, the real deal. Some of these labels you can't read. Uh, the upper left-hand corner, wow, look at all that crystal growth on there, just unbelievable. Um, that could be deadly, very seriously. It can be explosive, uh, depending on, especially if it's peroxides, all right, something to that effect. So we need to be very, very specific. Look at the can there. You see all that rust, uh, things are happening. There are reactions taking place and you have it in there to separate it from the outside environment. And yet you've got something that's eating away at it, right? And someday you open that door and boom, there's an explosion. You're done, you're over. Almost literally, it could be, right? So you wanna make sure storage is really taken a look at very specifically and make use, as it says here in your chemical hygiene plan and safety data sheets, which you're required to have for every single chemical you have in that storeroom. Okay. Labels, ah. When in chemical storeroom, each chemical bottle should have a legible, legible, all right? GHS, globally harmonized system classification labeling chemicals, compliant label. And there should be an associated safety data sheet for every chemical in the inventory. No exceptions allowed, All right? Now we had a huge change uh, that took place uh, legally in 2012. And then a few years later, it had to be finished by 2015, 2016. And that's when OSHA adopted the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, which is a UN program. It's, as far as I'm concerned, compared to the old types of uh, data sheets that, were, that we used to use, safety data sheets, um, material safety data sheets, MSDSs, as you will recall, uh, this is really good stuff, really good stuff. Very, very uh, means of making it safer and taking care of chemicals the way they need to be addressed. Um, again, no exceptions. You need to have everything done, what's written here, and I'm sure in your chemical hygiene plan. So having labels on stock bottles of diluted hydrochloric acid or diluted sodium carbonate or sodium hydroxide used are also a requirement. If there's a chemical in your inventory, regardless of the molarity, concentration, volume, et cetera, I think you're getting the point. It must be properly labeled. It must be properly labeled. And you'll notice, um, the chemicals that you purchase now as of 2016 must have the new labeling, including the pictograms, which you can see there on the label on the right, right? Um, and it lists there all the pieces that are required to have on the labeling. This is legal, this is law, this is what, what you must have. And okay. Ken, I'm just going to add from my own perspective here, the days of writing 0.1 MHCl in masking tape on an Erlenmeyer <laughs> flask or a beaker are long gone. <laughs> I just want to tell everybody that right there is actually, could potentially be an $11,300 fine from OSHA for non-compliance for labeling. I don't think they would go that far, but they could push to change that whole culture in your, in your department. Depends what kind of day they're having. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. So yes, uh, thank you so much for that, Ken. And I'm going to let you keep going. Here you go. Thanks. <laughs> Chemical inventory. All right, the OSHA has come. Now it's very interesting. If uh, up up to uh, 1990, 1991, uh, science labs were under the HASCOM standard. There was no laboratory standard. However, OSHA, though it took them a decade or so to figure out that uh, lab science labs could not be as safe as other places, so they really need to have their own standard. That's when the laboratory standard came out. However, pieces of the HASCOM flow into the laboratory standard. And the laboratory standard, which is 1910.1200, which is general industry, applies for maintaining a current inventory. We're talking chemical, right? 
current chemical inventory and chemical labels to identify potentially or known hazardous substances for employees, as well as being a better professional safety practice. Another reminder is to ensure that no chemicals are to be stored in food grade jars or bottles in the chemical storeroom or safety storage cabinets. Only use approved appropriate chemical storage bottles that are designed for storing chemicals. I don't care if you got all these bottles at home that you want to get rid of, so you're just going to bring them in and, you know, well, you know, we'll just fill these bottles. No, no. Find another place for your bottles, all right? You can only use appropriate types of containers for chemicals because some of these other containers can react with the chemicals, believe it or not. And then you're going to have some real problems, right? Or some, uh, they use metal, for example, purposely in case it drops so it won't shatter. If you had a glass type of container, right? There you go again, right? So we want to make sure you're using an appropriate one. Okay. Uh, instructional space signage. Again, OSHA and also NFPA, the fire people, have requirements. Science instructional space signage is required to alert occupants to potential hazards, risks, and safety actions to be taken for a safer instructional experience, right? And by the way, <clears throat> I'm sure a number of you are science teachers out there. Just remember, in your lab, the kids come and go. Oh, you stay. You stay there almost just about the whole day. So if you got a ventilation issue, you're breathing it in. All right, for storage issue, chances of accidents, you're there the whole day. Your chances of risk elevated dramatically, all right? So anyway, so you can see all of these various types um, of signage. And again, uh, this should be part of your chemical hygiene plan, these kinds of requirements. Uh, most certainly, uh, and there are different ones that you will find, for example, for no eating in a lab, uh, you might actually just see something in right and it says no eating in the lab, or you might see the one with the circle, the line through it. In other words, no, with the fork and the knife, no, no eating in the lab, those kinds of things. Uh, the one for the eye wash, the one for the shower, right? Toxic substances, truth fall hazards, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? All really important. Okay. Inspection recap, knowing what to look for and being able to identify any area of concern found throughout the science instructional spaces and related areas are the main reason for these annual snapshots of the science department are conducted. It makes sense to use a comprehensive template for safety inspections that allow for images and anecdotal notes to be taken and used to complete the inspection report as well as connections to the multiple health and safety regulations for various safety items found in the science department for consistency and compliance with OSHA or equivalent um, submissions. Now, certainly, again, remember what I said, let it be written, it must be done. What am I going to do with this inspection report? What am I going to do with it? All right? You don't keep it to yourself. You make sure the right authorities and hopefully there might have been maybe an assistant principal along with you or a principal, certainly chemical hygiene officer, et cetera. In writing, you send that report. I'd also send the superintendent of schools and recommendations of how these things need to be rectified. Remember, you are the one legally that are responsible for safety in that lab, not the superintendent, not the principal, not even the director, the curriculum director. It is you who was assigned to that lab legally, you're the one responsible to determine if it is safe or not. And if it's not safe, you don't do any hands-on activities because if you do and somebody gets hurt, I got bad news for you. You're gonna be it legally, all right? You're gonna be it legally. And I might meet you in court because the parent is gonna turn around and sue you and probably the administration also, but you'll be the main, the main one to take the hit because, oh, gee, you didn't let the administration know. That's what they're going to tell you. Oh, you didn't tell us about this. Uh, you know, we would have made those changes. Yeah, right, whatever. All right, so you've got something, you need something to fall back on so you can show, in fact, that yes, you did due diligence and you, those things needed to be done. And that's the reason you're not doing any hands-on activities, period. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Now, <laughs> my friends, here are some 
48 hour old photos. This is not from 20 or 30 years ago. This is from earlier this week. And I wanna show you what can happen if you do not do a, 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 a proper inspection. And yet on the tick box on your checklist, it was checked off every year. This is what can actually you can actually find. Buckle up, put on your race car five point harness because oh, this oh, happens. Oh. Everyone, here we go. Oh, sorry, Ken. <laughs> nice. this, is what you, this is what you were just talking about. I got all excited to, to, to go on. <laughs> but this is really what you had just captured there on that in the right. last thing that you said. Right. Right. If you do notice any safety is issues, document them, share them, get work orders done to, to remedy all of that. Because if you don't, there's no record. And you're right. The educator is usually the first one or the, that department chair. And then the, the administration at the school and then science supervisor. They call director. it shared, they call it shared liability, but shared liability, you know, yes. Yeah, it is shared liability. But understand the teacher's gonna be the main hit because you're the one legally responsible to determine if it's safe or not in that laboratory. Exactly. All right, we have some questions that we'll answer at the end that are bubbling in, but and show them the picture. Okay. Now Here take a look at this. Oh, Feast what a beauty. Feast oh, your eyes on this. I, I, the, and again, the, these are not staged photos. This is actual, factual, legitimate. And I won't name the jurisdiction that this is in. But if you look at that photo, there are multiple serious concerns that jump off right away. For example, that's a fume hood. You never store anything inside of a fume hood ever, period. There's a microscope, there's some uh, hot plates over there, hot plate stirs, there's some chemicals, I'm not sure what they are. There's a, uh, a bottle of Drano on top of a flammables cabinet beside the acid cabinet that you can see has burst. There's all kinds of apparatus, there's things on the floor and the best part is the power cord has power to it because the red light is on, ah. which means all of those things are energized at the moment. This is clearly a, an example of an unsafe situation. Now, this is a death wish. <laughs> this, this is terrible. Yes, this yeah, is terrible. Seriously. And it exists. So this yeah. is, this is, you know, I don't want anybody to be in a situation like this because this is preventable, totally preventable. Yeah. And it, if you thought it, it couldn't get worse. <laughs> <laughs> Now, oh yeah, <laughs> I can tell from looking at that acid cabinet that there is acid, there are acids and bases inside there because of that blackness that you see along the crease and around the frame. So what happens when incompatible chemical storage occurs is just that, that reaction that happens there. And if I break down chemistry 101, an acid and a base, that product is salt and water but i can tell from my experience i don't even have to smell that that there is formic acid in that cabinet that's where that black is coming from or very very old sulfuric acid but there's also going to be sodium hydroxide ammonium hydroxide some of those other bases will be in there for sure because you can see from the white precipitate that's fallen down across the bottom and on the sides where a little bit of airflow is going in and out this is also a terrible way to set this up. Terrible, terrible. Am I, am I dreaming or is the ass in a flammable cabinet in front of a door? <laughs> oh, th that's what I was just going to point out. And to make it worse, they have blocked an exit with two stacked cabinets that have- You know what, you know, are, who, I uh, blame? You know who I blame in part? Is the local fire marshal because in oh, yes. they're supposed to be going around to these schools and doing their inspections to make before the kids come in. This is like Correct. the summer break, right? How could this fire marshal not have cited this? Ever. Not close Ever. That this did not happen overnight. This is a long-term that, chronic problem. Yep, absolutely. And now, now wait. <laughs> there are chemicals there from 1966. 66. 
There is no way that chemical is still being used. Even at 10 grams a year, a 500 gram bottle would have been consumed by now. There is, the, if you look at the middle, there's a, a chemical, it looks like sodium hydroxide where it has broken through the top of the cap and you see that crust on the top, wow. just a disaster. You have all kinds of mishmash. There was an attempt to store these, segregate them. You can see that. Somebody made an attempt and then it looks like they gave up. And I don't, I don't blame them, to be completely honest. And look at the obstructions here. Oh. Again, and that's against another door. Just, I just want to point that out, Dr. Ken. That's against another door. But you cannot have your prep area, your storeroom, your labs. You cannot have any instructional space like this. Never mind from an emergency perspective, but you cannot have that just as a, a safe environment for working. That is, that goes against, that breaks every law. These four pictures we just looked at, OSHA caps out their fines at $134,340. Each one of these is a $134,000 fine as far as I'm concerned, because there's just so many things wrong in here. Anyway, anyway, this is a reality and do not let this happen. If you encounter this, there are mechanisms to remedy this and fix it. And yes, it will be expensive. Yes, it will be time capital uh, uh, involvement. Lots of people will have to be there, but it needs to be done for the safety of the teachers, your colleagues, your students and entire that whole school ecosystem. So that becomes a top priority. If you see it, if you're a licensed professional, all right, especially a licensed professional, um, correct. You see it, and you don't do anything about it. Again, legally, they're going to make mincemeat out of you in a court case if somebody gets hurt, all right? And the somebody could be another science teacher, by the way. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, when I looked at this photo, the first thing I said was, "Well, that's fascinating." I noticed the red cylinder, which is oxygen, does have a chain around it, that it is chained to that bookcase. Okay. But the green one, there are no chains, no restraint systems. There's absolutely nothing there. There's no valve cover in case it falls over. That is a giant projectile, my friends. Guided if missile. If that knocks like over, it will be like a missile. It will be like a torpedo and shoot through that cinder block while like it's nothing. Yep. Nothing at all. But they do have a fire extinguisher. <laughs> they, they do, yes. Yes, yes, you're right, they do. That's good for them. All right, so here at Science Safety, we deal with all kinds of, of, of things like that. And really, when you look at your overall safety program in your science or STEAM curriculum, there are these eight main pillars that a lot of different things branch off of. And it all starts and ends, and this is cyclical. This, this comes around and around and around. It doesn't just progress and stop, but it starts with safety training and safety qualifications and awareness. Program and document reviews, the things Dr. Ken talked about, chemical hygiene plans, ASCOM standards, safety manuals, the use of student safety contracts or acknowledgement forms, probably the cheapest insurance policy you could ever have. Is that a fair statement, Dr. Ken? Yes. Activity-based risk assessments. I cannot tell you, I cannot overemphasize the importance of making sure that you do a risk analysis and then the result, or pardon me, a hazard analysis, then the resulting risk assessment, oh, yes. and then take those safety actions from that, which might mean you decide you don't do it because the risk exceeds the educational utility or value of doing that and you don't do it while you're performing or conducting an experiment activity, it's beforehand, always prior. <clears throat> and that is a missing giant piece of this equation right here. So you can't have a culture of safety awareness without that central pillar. As Dr. Ken said, having material inventory, safety data sheets, critically important. You must have an idea of what chemicals are in your building what hazardous products are there and what quantities and where they are. You need to do those facility and lab inspections, critically important. 
another thing that Ken touched on tonight was safe and secure material storage. It's great that you have all this stuff, but lock that prep room every night, lock the laboratories, lock the cabinets that those chemicals are in just to prevent unwanted access. And access is a huge word right now. I knew I would get you to say something, Dr. Ken. <laughs> this teachers need to understand, even if you're taking a two minute bio break out of your lab, right. you know what I'm getting at, all right? You make sure nobody's in there unless you've got another fellow teacher that can go in and supervise. But generally, uh, you make sure things are locked and nobody's in there. All right, really critical. Exactly. Never leave it unlocked. Exactly right. And when you look at all of that holistically from a 360 perspective, that is exactly what this company does. That's what Science Safety does. And we do it with our, our mission and our vision is to make your schools safer. As Dr. Ken says, you can't make it safe, but you can make it safer. That R is the most important letter in that word right there, safer. And you do that through a whole bunch of different mechanisms and they all contribute towards a positive, safer environment for you and everybody in that school system. And as Ken talked about, there's a whole lot of regulatory pieces that come into play here. There's just so many aspects and if you don't understand them it can be overwhelming overwhelming but you need to make sure that it is spectral i'm going to borrow that word from you dr ken because i love it it's spectral and you need to incorporate and encompass everyone students with additional needs the paraprofessionals that are in there administrators educators parents everybody is involved in this so that said all of this will be available to everyone who participated today. There have been a lot of people asking about, well, where did you get those references? Where did you cite that from? Where did it come from? We are more than happy to make all of that available to all of, uh, all of our viewers, everyone in the audience. And Dr. Ken, the chat box has been filling up with questions. So if you're ready, I've got a couple of them for you right away. And I'll do, my, I'll do my best to stay quiet this time because I get all passionate and excited and just love to answer. Well, you can answer if you want. <laughs> well, okay. So here, here's a, we'll go back sequentially because I, I went over, I answered some while you were, while you were chatting. Oh, um, <laughs> Well, I, I have to do something. <laughs> Dr. Roy, what are your thoughts on acid cabinets that have a designated, I'm going to use that term, nitric acid compartment within them. Uh, I have seen them. I also have been involved directly in legal OSHA inspections. And the compliance officer thought that it was appropriate. I mean, this is what OSHA says. So if OSHA says it, then, right. then it, is, it is okay to, as long as it's isolated in there. Right? Correct. That's and the now, key. That's the key. And, and there is an addendum to that, which is you can't then just open that isolation compartment and take out that nitric acid bottle. You take out that whole little isolation compartment and put it in the fume hood and let the fume hood run. Right. Right. Because all those concentrated nitric yeah, acid vapors yeah, have yeah, now been yeah. built up in that little area. So when you open that, it's really going to punch you in the face. Yeah. It's powerful stuff. So Absolutely. thank you for, for answering yeah. that, but just good go question. that step further from yeah, a safety. No, 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 that was a very good question. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. Um, we have a question which you and I can answer later on. Someone is looking for the the uh, 32 inch clearance requirement for the uh, eye wash stations, right? And, and obstructions. We will find that on the ANSI website. That's yeah, just go to the ANSI website. Or you just Google it. Uh, that we'll, Google the question, and it'll uh, bring you to the ANSI website. And it's we will find that uh, in there. Doctor, oh, another. No one wants to talk to me tonight. It's all Doctor Ken. Doctor Ken. Is signage on prep room doors required? Great question. 
What yes. should it be? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Okay. No what should I say? About it. First thing, there should only be certain employees allowed in there. In other words, my point to you is even for your labs, all staff should not have a master key, which is going to allow them into any of the science areas, any of the instructional spaces, the storerooms, et cetera, et cetera. And I have seen this where principals say, well, you know, teachers keep losing their keys. So, you know, well, we just give them a, a general master key and that way they, they'll have no problem. Really? I don't think so. All right. Because you're breaking an OSHA rule right there under the HASCOM, all right, or even the lab standard. You must be trained to go into a laboratory. You must have been safety trained to go in and use that laboratory, right? And I've seen cases when I've done mock ocean inspections. Here I am doing a mock ocean inspection in a chem lab, a chemistry teacher, all right? I hear a chemistry teacher, the door was locked, using a key, all right, and going in there. Okay, well, that's fine. Then the other door, there's an English teacher coming in and the English teacher just left the cafeteria and is going to eat her lunch in the chem lab. And I turned to the chem teacher and I said, why is this person in here eating? Well, she doesn't like all the noise down in the cafeteria, so I let her eat in here. Ah. I'm sorry, red flag. No, Absolutely. are you kidding me? I mean, that I saw this personally. I mean, if somebody told me, I wouldn't even believe it, all right? So yeah, so anyways, back to the original question, right? Uh, the NFPA has signage that is required. I'm sure you've seen the four diamond system where yes. they go into the various color codes. This is so the firefighters know what they're getting into. And you're required any a room in that building, including a science lab, even a classroom if you have chemicals in a cabinet in the science classroom, all right? And especially the storeroom, all right? You are required. Check with your local fire marshal, all right? They might even be aware of it, to be honest with you, but you'll see right. their standards. It says that they are required to have that signage on the door, right? And again, so you want to have that, but you also want to have the piece that only, a, you know, approved entrance individuals uh, in there. No students allowed. No right, that's students on the, the prep room, Please. chemical storeroom doors. Don't sure. allow students. In especially, I've seen cases where teacher allows two students to go in. One of them's talking to the teacher. The other one is taking a magnesium ribbon roll. I mean, <laughs> it happens. It, and then the kid gets burned. Guess who gets sued? The teacher. Because attractive nuisance. You allowed that kid in there with all those hazards and resulting risk. Right. You're it. You're it. <laughs> so, yeah, signage on the door. Another great question. So... Here at Science Safety, we have a, a new product, which is our uh, safety inspection application, or lab, we'll call it a lab safety inspection tool. It will be launched here in the next 30 days. And it has those built-in templates so that you can take your smartphone or your tablet and walk through the department. And it will say, take a picture of the fire extinguisher. Is it this high on the wall? Does it meet all of these requirements? Take a picture of it, da, 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 da. And it will create an ongoing report. And it is all based on those legal standards and better professional safety practices. I hate to say it, it but that is a priceless resource for anybody to have, seriously. Absolutely advocate, use it. It's great. And it provides consistency because right now there is no consistency out there. Yep. It provides comprehensiveness that doesn't exist right now. And it provides you with that layer of protection that Dr. Ken talked about, because you've now documented everything with digital evidence. This is working, this is not working. Here's your list of, of uh, concerns and here's everything else that's great. It's very, very simple, very great. Uh, uh, I can't, I'm so excited to launch this thing. So it will be out the first week of May, hopefully. Maybe another day or two, but it'll be early May at the latest. And Ken's smiling. <laughs> right in time for your annual uh, inspections, which Ken, 
need to all be done prior to July. Is that correct? Good idea. <laughs> That's a very good idea. Yes. By the end of the school year, they all need to be done. Very good idea. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to uh, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Dr. Ken, I'd, I want to thank you. It's been an honor and a privilege yet again. And Dr. Ken, do you have any final thoughts, final words for us tonight regarding lab inspections or, so pardon me, science instructional space <laughs> <laughs> inspections? I learned something tonight. <laughs> it's hard to change sometimes, James. <laughs> it is, I know. I keep calling it. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, no, seriously, I think one of the things that I, I've said several times tonight, uh, let it be written, it must be done. And that, that is very, very important. All right. Um, and that, again, is to effect with an E, effect change safety wise in your laboratory. And one thing that administrators sit up and pay attention to is when you put things in writing. Why? Because it's a paper trail and they know. All right, for the legal courses to get their licenses, they know all about that stuff. If you talk to them about it, yeah, yeah, if they get right. to it, fine, but they'll like potentially ignore it, all right? But when you put it in writing, paper trail, because they know, and by the way, one more piece of advice, keep a copy at home, not in the office. You would be Very surprised. Very good advice. You would be surprised at how I've heard all of a sudden that, oh, gee, um, something is wrong with the computers and, and, and we lost all the memory stuff. Um, it was scrapped inadvertently. Well, yeah, that's because they think that your piece is on there, especially if there's a lawsuit. This is why you take it, put it on your own home computer or have copies of it, whatever. So again, let it be written. It must be done. Make sure you do it. Very good advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Ken. And I want to thank everyone for participating tonight as part of our ongoing science safety uh, monthly webinars. And we're more than happy to keep doing these. Thank you for attending. And we'll talk to you soon. Stay safer. Dr. Ken, what do you have to say? Stay safer. Stay safer. <laughs> Get the punch tonight. Do we, there it is. <laughs> Stay safer. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Take care, bye -bye. everyone. Thanks again. Have a good evening. A safer evening. Bye-bye. Safer evening. Very good.